This morning we're going to look at the subject from the book of Jude of praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. I have been interested to observe that people have expressed within the Christian community a great deal of concern that we no longer pray in our schools. I was raised in a environment where the first thing that happened every morning was the principal came over the PA system, made some announcements, read a portion of scripture, and then collectively the entire student body said the Lord's Prayer. And so the church every once in a while in some form of righteous indignation raises its voice and grumbles and complains about the route our nation is taking. Do I think it would be good for our schools to pray? Uh, yeah. But I am far more concerned that our churches pray. I'm far more concerned that our churches pray. And it seems to me to border somewhere on hypocrisy for us to <laughs> complain about the lack of prayer in our schools when most of our churches have a significant lack of prayer. Let's make sure, my friends, that Lawson is not among that group. But let us be, as leaders and attenders, deeply committed to being people of prayer. And it is missions weekend, so let me take you for one last clip to Ahuntsa, Quebec, and just show you the, how I ended my message uh, to those wonderful uh, French-speaking Quebecers in Ahuntsa. Take this as a blessing from God and from our church in Saskatchewan. Accepted it as a blessing from God and from our church in Saskatchewan. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Que la grâce et la miséricorde et la paix soient avec vous. De la part de Dieu le Père et de la part de Jésus Christ, le Fils du Père, dans la dignité et la charité. Amen. Saskatchewan Rough Rider mug. As we pray, let's pray for uh, the church in Ahuntsic. Good to have my good friend Jim Christian with us this morning. Jim, why don't you just come up and ask God to help us to hear the Holy Spirit, as he speaks to us through his word today, just pray for the ministry of God's word. Thank you, Jim. Chicago, huh? <laughs> I'd really have to pray hard. <laughs> <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord looks beyond our mistakes. I like, you'll say, oh, oh, it says Bobby Hall. Okay, okay. That's, that's really good. You're supposed to pray. <laughs> 
Father, we thank you so much for your presence in our lives, and we thank you for all the wonderful things you've done. But even more important than, than what you've done is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is always by the Holy Spirit. Father, I'm reminded of the man that went to heaven and he saw Jesus, he saw the Father. He said, I asked the dumbest question in all of heaven. He said, where's the Holy Spirit? And the angel leaned over and said, uh, he's on the earth. And so today we want to listen to the Holy Spirit and what he's saying and how we can learn to walk with him and, and listen to him and pray with him and see his glory on this earth. Jesus, and bless Pastor John and all of his staff, but in particular this word this morning. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you. As far as I know, when I read the gospel record, there were all kinds of times when Jesus was informally teaching his disciples. But only once that I have seen did they specifically come to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us. Every once in a while they ask, what in the world's going on here? But once they went up to him and said, Jesus, teach us. And the thing they wanted to be taught about was, Lord, teach us to pray. You see, they had noticed something in the Lord. The Lord would wake up a great while before dawn, and he would go on a long walk, and, and he would pray. They saw the Lord living a life of personal communion and waiting for instruction from the Father. And after watching this for a long period of time, their request was, Lord, show us how to pray. Jesus was nearing the end of his three years of ministry here on earth, and he knew he had to prepare his disciples for what was ahead. And he uh, said this to them in John chapter 16, verses 5 to 7. He said, now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The great news for all of us to understand today is Jesus did not leave us alone. And when Jesus returned to heaven, Heaven sent us the Holy Spirit. And now we move and live and do our ministry, handle our relationships in the instruction and help of the Holy Spirit. So he said the Holy Spirit is, I'm leaving. I came in a manger. Now the Holy Spirit is going to come. What did it look like? when the Holy Spirit came. Let me read it to you in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Huh. Jesus came, born in a manger, 
Holy Spirit came with a rushing wind. And it was like cloven tongues of fire were resting on the heads of everyone. And they received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what you need to understand here is right there, Acts chapter 2, right in this book, that is the beginning of the church. That's when the church was born. Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came, the church began to minister. This is the very start of the church. And right from the beginning, the church was a Pentecostal church. Right from the beginning, the church was a Pentecostal church. Now, some of us have kind of thought that being Pentecostal, we, like, we don't mind coming here. Um, but we're just kind of hoping nobody at work finds out. Because, I mean, Pentecostals are a little different. Well, the truth of the matter is the church from the beginning was a Pentecostal church. Projected world population by 2020 is 7.6 billion people. Uh, some of those will be Muslims, some will be Hindus, some will be Baha'i, some will be nothing, some will be worshiping uh, nature in uh, the back jungles of a continent. And some of them will be Christians. By 2020, it is, rec it is estimated that one billion people in the world will be Pentecostal. It, I, I just say all that to say this. <laughs> The church is a Pentecostal church. And the truth of the matter is, when you're rubbing shoulders around the world, about one out of seven people you rub shoulders with, one out of seven and a half people, are Pentecostal. This is no small thing. The Pentecostal church is no small thing. And that's because God's church has always been Pentecostal. That's how it started. When the day of Pentecost was come, when the church was born, when the church was given birth to, it was a Pentecostal church. And I want to suggest to you this morning that our shyness and our reticence and our reticence and our embarrassment about being Pentecostal should be thrown out some window somewhere, and we should bear, wear it as a badge of honor because God's church is a Pentecostal church. I'm not talking about denominationalism here. I'm just talking about how the church functions. Church functions as a Holy Spirit group of people. So we read in Acts chapter 2 that rather interesting story of the birth of the church doesn't make very much more sense than God coming to earth and being born in a manger. Really, when you think about it, it, it is kind of strange, isn't it? But God's ways are not our ways. We read a, another interesting development in the early church in uh, Acts chapter... Can we find that Acts chapter 10 portion, Dave? And then I'll come to Jude. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46, and... If we can't find it, I'll just read it to you. Acts chapter 10, 44 to 46. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, now circumcision is code word for Jewish, because if you were Jewish, a Jewish male, you were circumcised. Those of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, 
because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Huh. Amazing things happens. The Jews are surprised that God pours out the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles. You see, the Jews thought they had a monopoly on what God was doing, as God was a Jew and God only loved Jews. And here in Acts chapter 10, the um, Holy Spirit is poured out on the Gentiles. That is really an important thing for us to recognize about Pentecostal faith and Pentecostal tradition. Pentecostalism and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. Pentecostalism and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. The Holy Spirit had no boundaries. The Holy Spirit had no prejudices right from the start. The God made it clear that his love and his ministry was not just going to be for the Jews. It was going to be for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. The Holy Spirit is the great, great equalizer. And so the Holy Spirit begins to be poured out in a fresh way at the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of people attribute it to... Uh, in North America, to Los Angeles, it has earlier roots than that. When the Holy Spirit began to be poured out again in a fresh way in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Pentecostals began to be ridiculed a great deal. I was raised by a Pentecostal pastor. Dad is 83 now. 84 next month. No, 83 next month. And... Um, he went into a corner of southeast Calgary called Ogden to plant a church, to start a church. And I went to school, and the kids I was going to school with found out that my dad was a crazy guy trying to start a Pentecostal church. And they began to ridicule me, and, and they said, your dad's a holy roller, hey? Your dad's a holy roller. Your dad's a holy roller. I can still hear it. Your dad's a holy roller. And there was a couple of years in my school journey where I got beat up two out of three days on the way to school. Because my dad's a holy roller. I don't uh, regret those experiences looking back now because they put a certain strength in my spine and I don't stay up at night and toss and turn when somebody says they don't like me or don't like what I said. Don't lose a second of sleep over that stuff because I survived being beaten up. Your dad's a holy roller. But you know why we weren't liked? The primary reason we weren't liked is because we were inclusive and we were blowing the church world to smithereens. They picked on tongues a little bit, but the real reason they didn't like it is we were blowing the traditional church word to world to smithereens. You see, when the Holy Spirit began to be outpoured, we let black people preach. And a hundred years ago, the world didn't like that. And when the Holy Spirit began to move and the Holy Spirit was being poured out, we even let ladies preach. But our conviction came from seeing what the Holy Spirit was doing. And the Holy Spirit wasn't just laying his hand and power on an odd Jewish person here and there, but he was laying his hand on Jew and Gentile and white and black and aboriginal and male and female alike. And we just began to believe that's what God does. In the ecclesiastical world... 
didn't receive it. They began to despise us, and they began to say, your dad's a holy roller. Today, God has restored what he started with. And one out of seven and a half people in the world are Pentecostal. The church I was raised in, the church I was raised in is an inclusive church that has room for everybody. There's room at the cross for you. It's God's church. I know this morning there will be some people before I'm done who will have quite a bit to process because not only are we an inclusive people because the Holy Spirit is inclusive, we uh, do believe that speaking in tongues is, is quite a normal spiritual experience and that uh, you're not uh, needing to be booked into the psychiatric ward if you do it. I personally don't struggle with it a great deal because of my personal experience. I was 10 years of age. I went to church on Sunday night not because I had any great uh, compulsion to go to church on Sunday night. My dad and mom usually went to church on Sunday night. By usually, I mean 51 out of 52 times a year. They went to church. I went to church because they went to church. They never asked me if I wanted to go to church. I just went because they went. And I remember a Sunday evening really, really clearly in... Uh, 1965, I was 10 years of age. Can't remember what the preacher preached on. I remember sitting probably about in that section of the church. Uh, it had two long sections, nothing on the side. The center, two sections went on and on forever. But they did the same th thing at the end of every single Sunday night service. They invited people to go downstairs to the prayer room. You could either go down that side of stairs or that side of stairs. And I went to the prayer room not because I knew anything about praying, but I went to the prayer room because my dad prayed. And if dad was going to go pray, I was going to go pray. And so dad made his way down to the prayer room, and I made my way down to the prayer room. I was one of the first 15 or so down in the prayer room. There were 200 chairs set up in long rows like this, facing either the edge or back to back to each other in that room downstairs. And I got downstairs, and I went down there, and I kneeled down at one of those old wooden stacking chairs, and I put my head down, and my heart broke. And as a 10-year-old, this wasn't manipulated. The preacher hadn't taught on it. I wasn't even thinking about God. I was just going down to pray because my dad went down to pray. And my knees hit the ground, and the power of the Holy Spirit came over me. And as a 10-year-old, I began to speak in tongues. And the next thing I remember, other than every once in a while having to clean up the wet mess from my tears on the chair that was underneath my face, the next thing I remember is my dad tapping me on the shoulder about 11 or 11.15 at night and saying, John, I'm sorry to bother you. Obviously, God is meeting you in a very wonderful way. I'm sorry to bother you, but i got to take the car home because mom has to get to work for the midnight shift. When you've had an experience like that that has not been coerced or not been manipulated, you don't have trouble embracing these things. Never had any trouble. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, and we've been working our way as a church through the book of Jude, a believe in systematic teaching of Scripture because it makes us teach on some things we might ignore otherwise. 
And we get to Jude 20 and 21. And we read this. After talking about all the problems in the church, he says, you beloved, you dear friends, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So Jude says there's all these kind of problems out there in the church. You make sure you're looking after yourself. Make sure you're building yourself up. And then he says the other thing you need to be doing is you need to be praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that look like? Well, we'll talk about that as we continue our journey, but we read this as a starting point, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 14 and the first half of verse 15. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? Well, I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. Saturday church, uh, we began three years ago as a church family, a second kind of church plant within our church. And last night in Saturday church, we had a Q&A time at the end where people texted on their phones questions in for us to answer. And Dr. Martini, who is the academic dean at Horizon College and Seminary, helped me answer them. One of the questions was, is praying in the Spirit the only way to pray? The answer to that is no. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. It's not the only way to pray. But Jude says we are to pray in the Spirit. And Paul says, when I pray in a tongue, my Spirit praise I'll pray with the spirit I'll pray with the mind but when I pray in a tongue my spirit prays basic foundational understanding of how God has designed us requires us to comprehend and appreciate the fact that we are tripartite beings um, by that I mean we are three parts. For those of you who've been hanging around here for chunks of the last decade, this is probably not the first time you've heard this little chat. But we are tripartite beings. Tricycle. Tricycle has three wheels. Tripartite being three parts. And God has designed us with body, soul, and spirit. We understand our body. My sons are putting on a Father's Day party after church. My body is looking forward already to eating body. We understand body. Soul, we understand soul. The mind, the emotional part of us, uh, the part that falls in love with the Chicago Blackhawks. mind, soul, and then third part, the spirit. We are, in God's design, people of mind, soul, and spirit. A lot of the problems and frustrations in our world are because people are living, looking after their physical needs, and they're looking after the needs of their soul, as they should. We don't deny the importance of either of those. But many people are doing nothing with the spirit part of them. And we're designed to be three-part people. And if you don't look after the spirit part of you, it's like having a three-wheeler without the back wheel. 
You can probably make it go, but it's a lot harder. We're a three-part type being, and we need to look after all three parts of us, body, soul, and spirit. As I was telling that story, my fourth wheel of my lawnmower fell off again. Uh, that's bad news for me because my wife, God bless my good wife, even if she loves the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, my good wife usually cuts our grass for me, but not when there's only three wheels on the lawnmower. She's got attitude. Um, <laughs> because it's really hard to keep this thing going properly. No, I can do it with three wheels. She can't. So I'm the grass cutter till I can I've put the wheel back on about three times. Doesn't stay. So, you know, that's a sidebar that's going absolutely nowhere. Tripart <laughs> tripartite being. Now, the interesting thing about tripartite being is they can function independently of each other and at the same time. So you can chew gum, physical action, and work through a complex physics or chemistry formula. You can pray in the spirit and be walking. They function independently, but perfectly capable of operating all at the same time. When I was pastoring in Manitoba, the phone rang shortly after supper, might have even been the middle of supper, and one of the ladies of our church was uh, deeply distraught. She had just opened an envelope, and her husband, who was a medical doctor in the city, was suing her for divorce. She came to church faithfully. He never came. And uh, here was the reason the uh, divorce was going forward in the husband's eyes. He said she was crazy because she spoke to to in tongues and went to a crazy Pentecostal church every weekend that I happen to be the pastor of. Needless to say, when the case went to trial, I was one of her uh, witnesses. And the doctor's lawyer kept trying to get me to admit that the woman in question was nuts. And the reason I was supposed to admit she was nuts is because she spoke in tongues. And uh, he said things like this to me. Do you think it's uh, normal that uh, This woman can vacuum, and while she's vacuuming, she's speaking in tongues. Don't you think that's a little nuts? And God gave me this answer. Uh, was it a little strange that while you were driving to work today to this courthouse, you were thinking about the questions you were going to ask me? You were actually doing two things at once? And he went absolutely The good news is the husband lost the case. And the court decided his wife wasn't nuts because she spoke in tongues. Doctor didn't like that. And uh, he appealed it to the Supreme Court in Manitoba. And so I found myself spending a chunk of a week as a witness at the Supreme Court of Manitoba. I had received a promotion since the previous case, they had read the transcripts, the three Supreme Court Justices of Manitoba, and for some reason decided I was a doctor. So I became Dr. Drisner. For the only time in my life in the Supreme Court of Manitoba, I was Dr. Drisner. And they kept asking me, Dr. Drisner, 
this and that about whether this woman was crazy because she spoke in tongues. And uh, they ruled in this good lady's favor again and decided just because you spoke in tongues, you weren't nuts. And gave her the greatest financial settlement in the history of the province of Manitoba in the course of it. The previous greatest financial settlement was when a guy named Robert Marvin Hall divorced his wife. Received a <laughs> greater settlement than the wife of NHL WHA player Robert Hall. Pays to be crazy once in a while. <laughs> When you pray in a tongue, your spirit prays. Now, this tongue is the only way to pray in the spirit. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, Romans 8.26 says... The Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I think there are times when you're praying in the Spirit, you're not praying in tongues, but it's certainly not your mind that's praying, there's something deeper. <laughs> Remember at the altar of Central Tabernacle, in Edmonton one evening, being so moved with a desire for a family that I was concerned about, that they would come to Christ, understand God's great love for them, that I just had something inside of me begin to grow, and I, I just groaned and I wept and I groaned and I wept. I groaned and I wept for about an hour and a half. It actually hurt. <laughs> as I prayed for them. I, I think that's praying in the Spirit. I, I think there are also times when you can pray in your native language when you're praying in the Spirit. There is such a thing as praying with the mind. Uh, friends, we need to learn to pray better. Can I just throw some instruction out here? Some of our praying as Christians, it's really strange, to be honest. You ever, I hope I don't offend anybody here. That's not my intention. I just want to help us. But I, I've heard people pray like this. Father God, I thank you, Father God, that, Father God, you love us, Father God, and I thank you, Father God, that, Father God, we can be here, Father God, and you're so good, Father God, for letting us be here together, Father God. Father God, thank you, Father God, you are, Father God, you are so good, and I pray, Father God, that as we hear the message this morning, Father God, that, Father God, that you would be with us. I've heard people pray like that. And to the person who's listening to us, it sounds really kind of weird. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Uh, you probably noticed, uh, I hope I haven't offended you when I do this, but I'm not even convinced you have to close your eyes to pray. How are you doing, Barry? Good to see you. <laughs> Good to be with you. You're so special to me. I like you. I'm grateful for the place you have in my heart and my life. God bless you, Barry. Why do we do these things? Anyhow, we do them. But I, I think praying really is simply a matter of Father, 
that guy at uh, work who keeps bringing the pornography into the lunchroom is really bothering me. Can you show me what to do? I don't think it's any more complicated than that. So there is praying with the mind, and it's legitimate praying, but we also need to pray with the Spirit. And I think sometimes when you're praying in your, in your language, whatever your first language is, there are times when you, you sense the Spirit of God moving in your soul. And, and something goes inside of you, and you know it's not you praying anymore, but you're really, really praying. You're touching God. I remember I could take you to the place when I was pastoring in Manitoba. I was frustrated after a few years of ministry there because we weren't break, making a breakthrough in that community, and something rolled up in my soul, and I prayed. Hope again I don't offend anybody, but I said, God, show me how to minister to Mennonites. Because it was a Mennonite community, and if I couldn't touch Mennonites, I couldn't touch the community. And I knew I was praying in the Spirit. This was not ordinary little Father God, Father God, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that you love men. Father God, you love men. Father God, you love Mennonites. And I thank you for loving men. And it would be really neat, Father God. I was, it was Spirit praying. And it was about six months later, Sandy, that your parents walked into our church. I point at her because they're beautiful Mennonite people. Friends, God instructs us to be people who pray in the Spirit. I think the greatest need of the church is for us to rediscover the power of prayer and praying in the Spirit. It strengthens us, it builds us up, it builds our church up, it makes a difference in our community. And so uh, I want to leave us as we end with three challenges. kind of three take-homes. And uh, here's the first take-home. Could you see if you could arrange your schedule to come on out Friday night and pray for our church? And we're going to spend about 40 minutes praying in the sanctuary, and then we're going to spend 40 minutes where we host a day in the park for our community, to bless our community. <laughs> but these things are just works of man if God, by his Spirit, doesn't come and make them meaningful. So can we pray there? Secondly, I, I just know 1 Corinthians 14 says, the person who prays in the Spirit, speaks in tongue, edifies himself. There's a kind of a thing among Pentecostals that says we speak in tongues so everybody can think we're filled with the Spirit. Um, and there's an element of truth there. I, I don't deny it. But there's a good article, and there's about seven or eight copies of this left right by the east uh, entrant, exit entrance. And if you're one of the first seven there, these are complimentary every month, grab one. But the title of this, on the title page, the front page, the cover of this month's testimony uh, is Why Tongues and Not Purple Hair. In other words, if you're going to speak in tongues so everybody will know you've got it, man, you're, you're spiritual because you speak it. Why didn't God just make spiritual people have purple hair instead. It sounds a lot simpler and a lot clearer to identify. Good article. 
But that said, tongues is not so everybody can say, oh, you got something nobody else has or other people don't. That's not the purpose of tongues. The purpose of tongues is to empower us. And some of us struggle in our faith walk because we're not taking advantage of the gifts God gives us, one of which is praying in the Spirit. So here's my second take home. Those of you who speak in tongues, for too many of us, it's something that happened back there somewhere. I got it in 1965 at the church in Calgary, and we love telling the story, but haven't done a thing with it since. I challenge you to try to take 10 minutes every day this week and just speak in tongues. And I think you'll begin to feel some new strength growing in your heart and your spirit. My third take home is uh, if this is all kind of new and strange and you're not really sure what to do with it, uh, begin to read the book of Acts, fifth book of your New Testament, and, and kind of get a feel for how the early church conducted itself, and then begin to pray a simple prayer. Father, anything you have for me, anything you have for me, I really want. Anything you have for me, I really want. So this is, if this is of you, give it to me. And uh, Friday night, if you have been praying that way all week and you're, you really want to break through, we're going to take time in our minutes at the start here to pray for anybody who would just like uh, that kind of a breakthrough. Here's a great promise to close with. Did we catch it from Luke? Chapter 11 and verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? But your loving Heavenly Father wants to experience his presence and blessing. Hey, a quick video clip about for our fathers, and then we'll dismiss the service. Uh, can we find that? Fip Dave forgot to do it earlier. Sorry, bless you. help your kids find their purpose by modeling good things for them and I would suggest that one of them should be seeing you in a place of prayer regularly this is your first time at Lawson so glad you're with us I hope you filled out a connection card uh, we have a book we'd love to give you as a gift from us just visit the connection center which is kind of this oval shapey circle shapey thing on the other end of the foyer let's stand and close our service in prayer
Father, we really do want everything you have for us. We want to be uh, good members of your team. We want to be uh, faithful disciples, faithful followers. So help us. We would invite you to teach us how to pray in the Spirit. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Water baptismal prep class at 4.30 this afternoon in my study. We've had church. Let's go be the church. God bless you. You are dismissed.